Hi, there's Smart Drivers talking to you today about Labor Day weekend, traveling on the on the long weekend, keeping yourself safe. As well, we're going to talk about back to school next week <laughs> and some winter driving tips for those of you who are coming up here and are getting ready to do your driver's test and postponing it till next spring, six, eight months from now. Don't do that. Take your test in the wintertime. We're going to talk about all those things today and uh, happy to be back after a bit of a break here for three weeks. Uh, did some time in uh, Ontario and very happy to know that that was what I, where I was because we had some tremendous fires here uh, in the area of Okanagan Valley where I live. So welcome, welcome everybody. Carrie's here tuning in from Minnesota, elevator fan, Mont Monticello, Indiana. Uh, Nelmic, uh, no, when you change lanes, you simply want to accelerate a little bit. You don't really want to go too much above the speed limit, but uh, slight increase in speed and Corey will put up the video for you on changing lanes. Corey is here, Bricks for Wheels. Corey is the moderator, does an excellent, excellent job of getting up the videos uh, that I suggest you have a look at for more details. Uh, my friend Marion is here, hello. Uh, elevator sick with COVID, that is unfortunate my friend, sorry to hear that. Hope you get better soon. Uh, Pierce was watching videos of driving, awesome. Uh, Silas, uh, question when lights to use at night to not blind people, higher low beams, definitely the low beams and once you get in the vehicle and just play around with that high beams, low beams, you'll be able to figure out pretty quickly which ones are better, especially you have one of those newer vehicles <laughs> with the high beam headlights that allow you to see to Mars, <laughs> so you'll be able to figure out that it's definitely low beams. Uh, Eric, tuning in from Eden Prairie, Minnesota, hello, hello, and uh, Vega. Vagabond, hello my friend. So lots of people here, uh, busy, have questions, uh, definitely ask your questions. The way that we do it here is we spend the first 10 or 12 minutes with the presentation, get through the presentation, and then we spend the remainder of the hours answering questions about passing a driver's test, uh, questions about becoming a safer, smarter driver, or starting a career as a truck or bus driver. We can help you with all that. Uh, Piers, can you show me what the hand over hand steering for steering wheels? So basically hand over hand uh, Pierce is that you grab the steering wheel you move it over and or so you're gonna go this way And then you move it so it's hand over hand Okay, is what you're gonna be doing and as well There's a video here Corey will show you put that up for you on steering the vehicle hand over hand uh, hand to hand which is sliding the wheel to this uh, in some more so in Europe uh, some places require a hand to hand hand to hand tends to be a little bit slower. I don't really like it uh, <laughs> Other driving instructors call it milking the cow <laughs> Which I guess I Don't really I did I had milk cows when I was young So I know what that is, but I don't really see where they come with it. The only time that you can Use one-handed steering is when you're reversing you can put your hand your uh, one hand on the steering wheel and then your other hand behind the passenger seat and that's going to help you to turn your hips uh, So you can look out through the back window. So for those who are reversing with one hand you can use Backup cameras you can use mirrors, but you need to still be looking out through the back window for your the bulk of your reversing okay, and if you're driving backing up farther than one vehicle length, you will want to be uh, stopping, pausing, having a look forward, and then doing a 360 degree scan and then continuing. So for those of you in the state of California, you'll be doing backing along a curb or Oregon also does it as well, uh, 50 feet, approximately straight back. And You'll be looking out through the back window. You need to keep about three feet from the curb so you have some wiggle room so you can maneuver the vehicle and continue to go straight back. Uh, Rawson, I am great. How are you, my friend? Awesome, awesome. Uh, as I said, I got back, had a bit of a break here, so it's really great. Uh, Marion says sometimes you use both of those actions, hand over hand and hand to hand. Yes, if you're only turning the steering wheel, if say you're going around on a left curve, you're only going to turn the steering wheel about half a turn or quarter, quarter to half a turn. If you're a quarter to half a turn, you don't even have to move your hands on the steering wheel. You can just move the steering wheel like this without taking your hands off the steering wheel. So it's going to depend a little bit how uh, much you need to turn the steering wheel. Now on right hand turns, you're going to need to turn the steering wheel approximately one revolution, one rotation. So uh, then you're going to have to use the hand over hand for driving. 
Uh, uh, pedals. I was on a road trip in the city. The driver got in the car wreck, and now I am afraid to ride or drive, dealing with health repercussions. How do I trust a car again? I've had my license for one year. Uh, pedals, uh, you're just going to have to get exposed to the vehicle. You're going to have to get back into the vehicle and get used to being in the vehicle again and getting comfortable with that. So it's kind of little bits frequently at the beginning of little bits of time in the vehicle. And then as you get more and more comfortable, you can push yourself so that it's more and more time, right? It's kind of like the curve that's going to go along like this. And then eventually you're going to get to a point where you're not going to be terrified of being in the vehicle, but it's exposure therapy that you're going to have to get in the vehicle, just figure out where the secondary controls are, figure out how to do up your seatbelt, figure out how to, you know, adjust the seat, adjust the mirrors, those types of things. Uh, Corey will put up the video for you on uh, eight tips for adjusting secondary controls in the vehicle. Do that, back up in the driveway, drive forward in the driveway, those types of things. And the then once you're comfortable with that, then you get out into low density traffic, driving around in residential areas and those types of things. As well, I would suggest to you that you work with a driving instructor who works with seniors uh, because they tend to have more experience working with people who have challenges in driving those types of things. If your anxiety is really bad and you have really bad PTSD, then you may need to work with a professional. You may need to work with a psychologist or an occupational therapist or a psychiatrist. So you may need somebody else working with you and working in tandem with the driving instructor to be able to get you back to driving. So that's kind of the path. As well, Corey will put up the video for you on uh, fear and anxiety, nine tips for fear and anxiety. So have a look at that as well. Okay, uh, Nelmic, will the examiner have you change lanes multiple times on a highway test or a few times? Uh, Nelmic, no, it's gonna depend on where you are, what proximity you are to a highway. And if you do go out on a highway, they're not gonna get you to change lanes multiple times. They're only gonna get you to do it once, maybe. Okay, uh, how do you know if you have good space when you look at your wing mirrors before you switch lanes? Uh, a rule of thumb is, is that the car should be in the top one third of your mirror uh, when you're changing lanes with the mirrors. But also you got a shoulder check and make sure that there's nobody in your blind areas when you're changing lanes. In addition to that, minimum three flashes on the signal before changing lanes. That way it gives other drivers a chance to help you out with changing lanes. So the first flash of the signal gets their attention. The second flash allows them to locate you. And the third flash allows them to take some sort of evasive action, whether they have to speed up to get past you or whether they have to slow down to get behind you, okay? If it's heavy traffic, then you put your signal on. If nobody's creating a gap, then hug that left side of the lane and people are gonna move because your light's flashing, you're hugging that left side of the lane, you're not getting out of your lane, but you're hugging that left side and it communicates to other traffic that you potentially could be coming over into that other lane of traffic. 3PO, is this the new time for streams from now on? Welcome back, Rick, thank you, my friend. Uh, I'm gonna see how this goes, 3PO. We might move it to four o'clock. Uh, I just find that six o'clock gets too far into the evening, but we'll see how it goes here. Uh, I'm not gonna not gonna say no just yet. Uh, excellent. All right, uh, Michael, you passed your driver's test. That is awesome, my friend. Congratulations on passing your driver's test. What did you do to go and celebrate? Woo! Because there is nothing like passing your first driver's test. Awesome, awesome. Okay, excellent. So. Vanilla, you are most welcome. Happy to help here. We can help out uh, going back to school and what we needed to be more of a defensive driver, like stopping for the school bus. Yes, those types of things. I'll talk about that after the presentation uh, here. I'll answer one more question, then I'll get over to that, and then we'll get going. Um, DL, I am based in Fredericton, New Brunswick. I am one of your subscribers. I passed my driving test yesterday. Thank you so much. And that is awesome news. Congratulations. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, what did you do to celebrate passing your driver's test there in uh, Fredericton? Awesome, awesome. That's great news. Corey's put up those videos I suggested. Definitely have a look at those. Uh, Mary and I had an interesting moment on Sunday. I put my signal on into the left lane and vehicle behind me was far enough away and then he sped up and blocked me out of the lane. <laughs> yes, they're going to do that, Marion. Uh, but like I said, just leave your signal on, hug that left side of the lane, and I'll tell you right now, they will move pretty quickly, 
okay they will do that for sure all right so let's get over to the presentation we'll spend about 10 or 12 minutes on this and then we'll come back and we'll finish answering your questions for the remainder of the hour road trips and long holidays labor day weekend this weekend and as well next week it's uh, back to school for a lot of uh students so we're going to help you with all of this oh there we go all right for those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s. I uh, drove bus for the Greyhound in Australia, one of the regional bus lines there in the early 2000s. Became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997. Most of my experience is with semi-trucks, air brakes, log books, those types of things. However, uh, I've learned a lot <laughs> about defensive driving, uh, teaching new drivers, learner drivers and answering a lot of questions and learning about a lot of anxieties that new drivers have, particularly around merging, changing lanes on highways and those types of things. Uh, so it's been a really good learning experience here on YouTube. Uh, 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne in legal history with uh, an expertise in policing. As you may or may not uh, know, legal history is the study of policing, courts and prisons. My expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. 2015, I started the YouTube channel and the online business, and it has been wildly, wildly more successful than I could have imagined here in the next few months uh, before the end of the year, I guess. We're going to turn over 10, 000, or 300,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel. Uh, we are almost at 900,000 views a month, which is just absolutely crazy numbers, just crazy, crazy numbers. And we're just about to hit uh, 50 million views on the channel overall, so it's been uh, pretty successful. Corey's put up the autobiography over at the Smart Drive Test website. Uh, if you want to have a look at that, you can learn more about me and the business. All right, so some new videos. I got up some videos while I was away. Uh, one in Montreal, some freeway driving on the 401 in Toronto. Uh, for those of you who have been to Toronto, you know that there are collector lanes and there's express lanes, the straight through lanes. And overall, there's about uh, 10 lanes of traffic going east-west through Toronto. So some tips about driving on the freeway there. Uh, five city driving tips, and I uh, repurposed some of old video clips uh, with my friend Big Mac Sam there in the Bronx. So city driving tips in both the city of Montreal, Canada, and in the Bronx there in New York City. And uh, different traffic lights, definitely have a look at that. Uh, defensive driving tips in the city of Montreal as well. They have different traffic lights. We could talk about that later, uh, about how they are safer, in my professional opinion, than regular traffic lights. So, traveling for the long weekend, traveling for any weekend, do preparation on your vehicle. Make sure that it's in tip-top condition. Uh, check all the fluid levels under the hood, the brake fluid, the oil, engine oil, transmission fluid, radiator fluid and whatnot, power steering, check all of that before you take off. Uh, check your tire pressure. Uh, most new vehicles in the last 15 years are all going to have uh, tire monitoring gauges on them, so you don't have to do that, but do check and make sure that you have adequate pressure in your tires. Good wear on the tires as well, quality tires. Uh, check your wiper blades if you haven't checked those in a while. And if you're unsure about anything that may need more work or an expert uh, opinion about that, definitely go to an automotive technician, not a mechanic, an automotive technician, and get your make sure that your vehicle is not going to break down when you're on your road trip. All right, uh, navigation, uh, make sure you know where you're going and know what you're doing. And uh, make sure that you have two sources of directions for where you're going because I was following my phone when I was coming back from Montreal through Toronto and the goofy thing was telling me to go north on the 400 I'm like I'm not sitting in traffic for another 15 minutes and I just kept going on the 407 and got back on the 401 didn't sit in any more traffic <laughs> because we all hate sitting in traffic so your phone isn't going to be always the best source of information uh, if you're unsure, get help. Uh, when you're looking at Google Maps, make sure that you're planning breaks. Uh, whenever we take the trip down to Vancouver Island between here and Tawasson, which is the BC Ferries, uh, we always stop in at Hope. There's a playground there, a place to walk around, get some exercise, uh, good coffee shops there and those types of things, and we can get fuel. So it's the halfway point between here and catching the ferry over to Vancouver Island. If you have children, playgrounds and those types of things, and if you get lost, stop and look at the directions, or if you get lost, stop and ask somebody at a fuel station or those types of things. 
Uh, one time we got lost in Hope back when I first started going to Vancouver Island and couldn't figure out how to get back onto the Trans-Canada Highway. And oddly enough, yes, indeed, we were going the wrong way because we were going to take uh, the Trans-Canada Highway through the, uh, through the pass. And we didn't want to go through the pass. We wanted to get back on the Coquihalla. So we had to figure out how to do that. So we stopped and asked for directions. All right, uh, if your kid's in the, in the vehicle, make sure that you have activities, audio books. Uh, you can go to the library. You can get books that have uh, audio that accompanies them, and the kids can look at the books, and they can listen to the story on the stereo system in the vehicle, podcasts, uh, audio books, uh, novel stories, those types of things, uh, games, and have accessibility to items, food and water in the cars, and those types of things. And if you can have somebody handing that stuff to you, it's going to be even better when you're driving. Okay, preparation, food and drink in the vehicle. Assign roles, the front passenger navigates, children look for landmarks. Uh, and this is one of the things you're going to do when you're driving and have your phone or you've done the work on Google that you know you're gonna turn left at the McDonald's. Uh, when you're going down Smith Street and you can have the kids looking for Mc the McDonald's and you can get them involved in your navigation as well. Have blankets and pillows in the vehicle so that uh, kids and other people can have naps while you're driving and whatnot, especially if you're going for more than one day at a time. Uh, prescription medication, know its effects uh, when you're driving. Ask your pharmacist, ask your doctor, and make sure that you don't leave your prescription medication at home, especially if you're a diabetic or you have other issues, long-term issues that require medication to keep you on the corner, kind of even keel. All right, uh, cruise control, You learn how to use your cruise control in your vehicle. If you have standard cruise control, set it at one or two kilometers an hour uh, under the flow of traffic, and that way you're not gonna be on and off the cruise all the time. Uh, if you have adaptive cruise control, even better, because it will take care of how what your following distance is behind other vehicles. So you can set it at two seconds, four seconds, and six seconds. I recommend that you set it at a minimum of four seconds. Uh, we had a vehicle with adaptive cruise control when I was in Spain, and it was absolutely uh, amazing. Really, really great uh, adaptive cruise control. So learn how to use that for sure. Night driving, if you are tired and you cannot stay awake, the only way that you're going to be able to stay awake and drive is to pull over and get some sleep in a safe area in a truck stop or in a rest area or someplace like that. Make sure you lock your doors because drowsy drivers rest in pieces, okay? And coffee, rolling the windows down, turning the stereo up really loud, none of that is going to keep you awake. You will fall asleep if you're tired. Okay, take a break every couple of hours. Plan your breaks when you're planning your trip on Google. Exercise for playgrounds for kids and know that if you eat heavy meals that you are going to be tired, okay? It's going to make you sleepy and drowsy as well as your biological clock. Know that from one to three or four in the afternoon, you're gonna wanna fall asleep, especially if it's nice and toasty warm in the car. Uh, it's sunny outside, bright days and those types of things. You're circadian rhythms are going to dip and you're going to want to go to sleep same thing with the middle of the night 1 to 5 a.m in the morning is the hardest time to stay awake when you're driving so plan your breaks accordingly and sometimes just pulling over and getting 20 minutes of kip is going to keep you safe and not see you falling asleep at the wheel wear comfortable clothing when you're driving uh, t-shirt and jeans comfortable running shoes take off any bulky clothes especially if it gets cold and you're wearing big jackets and those types of things uh, have emergency clothes in the vehicle in case you dump a drink on yourself or something like that uh, and have back supports if your back is hurting and you need back supports and have accessibility to this stuff that you need in the vehicle so that you're not reaching and being distracted when you're driving Emergency stops and breakdowns. If you're not any good at changing a tire, then I suggest that you have uh, AAA or CAA, the Canadian Automobile Association or the American Automobile Association. It only costs about $100 a year for a membership. They will tow you a certain distance. They will come out and give you a boost on your battery if you leave the lights on, drain the battery or whatnot. Uh, have a survival kit in the vehicle, which includes food, drink, your prescription medication, your glasses, those types of things and have a cell phone charging cord in your vehicle. Most vehicles are gonna have this in this day and age uh, because if you break down 
and your phone is dead, you can't call for help, all right? So have all of this. And do not pull over on the side of the interstate or highway. Find some place, if you can, to pull off, and that way it's going to keep you safe because, trust me, the side of an interstate is a very dangerous, dangerous place, and you do not want to be sitting there on the side of the road. So good luck on your driver's test, and remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. All right. There we go. Excellent. Eric, uh, pop for the kids, even Mountain Dew. <laughs> I'm not sure whether you want to give Mountain Dew, especially a Mountain Dew from the U.S. because it has caf caffeine in it. <laughs> not sure whether that's your best your best option. Uh, Marion, you were heading to the Fraser Canyon. This is the longer route. Yes, it is. The Fraser Canyon is about an hour, an hour and a half longer, depending on traffic, uh, instead of going over the Coquihalla, for sure. Excellent. Check mirrors and back, yes, while driving. Check your mirrors, Google Maps, I know. Okay, excellent. Corey's put up the video on how to navigate and route plan to a destination in your vehicle, and that'll show you how to do that as well. Uh, have a look at Google Maps just to confirm what you're doing and where you're going. Uh, and as Eric says, GPS is not always, always accurate. accurate. Uh, what do you think about the WASI for navigation? Uh, I haven't tried it, uh, Eric. But yes, the navigation on your phone is not always accurate. As I said to you, for whatever reason, when I was coming back from Montreal and going through Toronto, uh, we're on the 407 and it's taking me north to the 400 to go back to my mom's place in Wingham. And I'm just like, you can see the red line on the highway, which indicates that you're going to sit in traffic. And believe me, you, after six hours of sitting in traffic, I mean, at one point, I think we were stopped for half an hour 40 minutes and i was just like yeah i am so done i just want to go home i don't want to be sitting in any more traffic i don't care if you think it's shorter i don't think so okay uh pierce i'm trying to be creative on this driving opportunity excellent uh elevator fan if you have tolls along your route make sure you have the money on you yes and as well with tolls a lot of Toll roads now are just going to send you the bill in the mail, uh, especially if you don't have a transponder, it's going to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, for example, the 407 is $35 each way. It's pretty expensive. So I don't know what the tolls are up and down the eastern seaboard in the U.S. now. I know that you have to pay for the Verrazano Bridge going into Staten Island, the George Washington Bridge. Uh, and other toll routes in New Jersey and whatnot. So know that, that these are all going to have tolls. As well, uh, some of the bridges in Vancouver are going to have uh, tolls. And uh, so just know, and all the smart drivers here listening here on the live stream or we're watching on the replay, just leave down in the comment there where you live and if there are any tolls in and around the area where you live, and that'll help people out for sure. Uh, Ross and I do turn my dash board when I'm driving at night down my dashboard yes and Rawson that is an excellent point and one of the things that I recommend as well uh, when you're driving at night turn your dash lights down in brightness and that way it's not going to cause fatigue because our eyes at night are driven are drawn <laughs> to light and the light on the dash is going to draw your eye one of the things that happened in my vehicle, I changed the stereo a couple of years ago, and of course it's got these stupid flashing blue lights on it, and it's super bright. I find it super annoying at night, and actually when I'm driving at night, I actually put a towel or something over it, so it's not like nye, nye, burning my retinas out while <laughs> I'm driving at night. But yes, definitely turn down the uh, dash lights, and it's going to reduce fatigue when you're driving. Uh, Mary, no tolls in my area. Don't think uh, there are any tolls down here at all. Awesome. Uh, Mary, sitting in traffic with your young kids in the vehicle is not a good idea. I don't have, I know I have done it. Uh, yeah, when you get stuck in the vehicle with little kids, uh, you're just like, yeah, just let me out of here. Please let me out of here. <laughs> uh, Nelmick, should we book a road test on a Monday or Friday or are those days very busy? Uh, Nalmec, just take whatever you can get. Get the earliest driver's test that you can. Don't try and be strategic about it because it's going to be one day is going to be the same as another day. Uh, it's all random, all right? And it's not going to matter what day you take your test. Just take your test, do it, and get it over with, okay? Uh, A, do you have to mirror so, uh, signal shoulder check in that order? 
Uh, no, it doesn't matter what order you do it in as long as you do it. And the other piece about it, mirror signal shoulder check, is that you're going to be signaling and shoulder checking almost at the same time because you can be putting the signal on with your hand while you're looking over and checking your mirror. So it doesn't matter what order you do it in so long as you do it. And if, if a driving instructor tells you, oh, you didn't do it in the right order, get, go away. Just go away. Because it doesn't matter as long as you do it. As long as you put your signal on, you shoulder check, you check the mirror, <laughs> you're golden, okay? Doesn't matter what order you did it in, because everything's going that way, okay? The signal's going that way, your head's going that way, the mirror is over there, you're looking at the mirror, you're checking your center mirror, slowing down, that those sorts of things. So, doesn't matter what order you do it in, okay, my friend? Uh, Pierce, uh, I was fed up with my sister and my driving, and secondly, nothing else. I uh, couldn't be trustful, I wasn't. Uh, trustful of knowing how to drive as I was doing driving. Okay, uh, Pierce, not sure what your question is there. Maybe you could rephrase that for me, my friend. Uh, Brad, five-hour course. Uh, what is a five-hour course, my friend? Okay, uh, 3PO, I'm convinced Wazi is going to kill someone one day. It leads to the weirdest roads. Uh, <laughs> 3PO, it's not just Wazi. Google does the same thing. Uh, 2016, when I went back driving truck, they sent me to the same location on two different occasions. The first time, uh, straight up the highway, make a left, and went down, and the destination was on the right. Easy peasy. The next time I did it, I didn't really quite remember which highway it was, and I didn't write down the directions. Of course, I trust the, the, the phone again. And the next thing you know, we're driving an 18-wheeler through residential streets and whatnot, and I'm like, where the heck are we going? Because Google, for whatever reason, doesn't take you down the most direct route. They take you the route that they think is the shortest. And I'm just like, what are we doing? <laughs> so, Wazi is no better than Google as far as I'm concerned. So, make sure that before you get in the car, if you're going to places you haven't been before, look on Google and figure it out and figure out which is going to be the easiest way for you to get there. If you're in a hurry... And I will tell you this from personal experience of driving all over the United States of America. Stick to the interstates. Don't get off on some state road or some highway that you think, oh, look, that's a more direct route. It's not a more direct route. If you're in a hurry and you have a limited amount of time to which you have to get there because you're going there on the Labor Day weekend to spend time with your family, stay on the route you know, the interstate. It is going to be the fastest route for you. All right, uh, 3PO, interesting. I haven't had that many problems with Google Maps, okay. Uh, uh, Nelmic, should we book a road test between 10 and 2? Okay, Nelmic, you need to stop listening to all your friends. <laughs> book your road test. Take the slot that you can get, okay? Get your road test. Take your road test and book it, all right? That's fine, okay? If you can get one in the morning, take one in the morning. If you can take one in the afternoon, the only thing that I would say to you, Nelmic, is the time that your road test is. So say, for example, it's on a Wednesday at 8 a.m., make sure that you're practicing in and around the test center at the time when your test is. So if it's at 10 a.m., make sure that you're practicing Monday to Friday at 10 a.m. so you know what the traffic is in and around the test center where you're going to be taking your test. Okay, just get a test date, okay? Don't try and pick the time or the day or the driving. None of that works. You just got to take it. Take it, okay? Because your job as a student is to demonstrate to the examiner that you have due care and control of the vehicle in changing traffic conditions. All right? That's all you need to do to pass your driver's test. Uh, Marion, I trusted my Garmin one weekend while in Vancouver Island. It took me 56 kilometers past where I was supposed to turn off. <laughs> yes. Been there. Done that. Uh, Pierce, I'm just sharing you about my life time of my life Rick about learning how to drive okay thank you for that my friend uh, Megan is it normal to feel scared driving on the main road yes it is very normal Megan and with more practice more exposure to driving you're gonna get more comfortable with doing that but yes at the beginning there's going to be some trepidation and some anxiety around driving on the main road and it is not unusual at all my friend so Corga put up the video for you on tips on highway driving and that will give you some defensive driving strategies to put in place that are going to keep you safe uh, when you're driving. Uh, 
A, is, it, is posture important when you're driving? Yes, in posture and seat position are incredibly important when you're driving. You want to adjust the seat so that you are both comfortable and in control of the vehicle. So when you adjust the back of the seat, you should have a slight bend in the elbows uh, when you have both hands on the steering wheel at 10 and 2. And if you put your foot behind the brake pedal, so your right foot, for example, uh, behind the brake pedal, there should be a slight bend in your knee for the front and forward and back of the seat, okay? And then the head restraint should be minimum at the top of your ears in your vehicle. Comfort and control for adjusting the seat on the vehicle. Yes, posture is important. Uh, Emily, I've had a few instances of making a left-hand turn, waiting for my front steer tires on the uh, line, only person behind me. Uh, come out last minute. Okay. So what do you mean that they're coming out at the last? I Making behind the opposite. Um, so Emily, where are they coming from that they're coming out into the intersection at the last minute? I don't understand that. Uh, so essentially you're waiting with your front steer tires on the front crosswalk line when you see the person coming and the gap is behind that vehicle, you want to start driving straight. So when the person on the other side, the front of the vehicle hits the stop line on the other side, you want to start driving straight into the intersection and then going in behind them is what you want to be doing when you're turning left. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not, not really following you with what you're saying about they come out at the last minute. Where did they come, come from that they're coming out at the last minute? Uh, elevator, if you're driving to work in the morning, allow more time for school buses during the school year. Yes, especially if you're in a rural area and they have school buses and you know that the school buses are stopping along the route where you are, then yes, you're going to have to allow more time for that, especially if you're driving at that kind of 7 to 9 o'clock in the morning or you're driving that kind of 2.30 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon and there are school buses, then you're going to have to allow yourself more time when you're driving. The other piece about it is if you're going to school in the morning or you're dropping kids off in the morning, know that you're going to have to pay attention. You're going to need to allow yourself more time because there are going to be students crossing the roads at intersections and those types of things. So keep all of that in mind and allow yourself more time when you're driving to keep yourself safe during this back to school time, which is next week. Uh, Emily, last minute they decide to go straight through the intersection instead of stay in the left turn lane. Okay, uh, opposite me on the other side of the intersection. All right, so Emily, that's just a matter of observation. If they're sitting in that left turn lane and all of a sudden they decide to deke out of that left turn lane and go straight, uh, you're going to have to, it's, it's a matter of having kind of mapping and tracking the entire intersection. And as well, the position of their vehicle is going to indicate what they're doing, all right? If, if they're in that left turn lane and they decide that they're going to go straight through the intersection, they got to get out to the right and they got to angle their vehicle. So as soon as you see that vehicle angling, then you know that they're going to proceed straight through the intersection. Now I haven't, I mean, it's kind of random. I've only seen that every now and again. If you're, <laughs> I'm not sure why you're running into that all the time, uh, but it, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. It does happen, but it's again, one of those unpredictable actions of other road users. And you're just going to have to be aware of that when you're sitting at the intersection waiting to turn left. Uh, hey, how do you know when to start stopping? When I stop, I stop slightly too early. Uh, that's one of the things that I would suggest you start. You do some more parking lot maneuvers, parallel parking, uh, reverse versing into a parking space, backing into a parking space, and three-point turns. All of that is going to help you with that braking and uh, getting mastery of the primary controls, the steering wheel, the gas pedal, and the brake, because this is what you're having with is that... Uh, you're going to have to figure out how much braking you need to actually stop at the place where you want to stop. For example, a correct stopping position, having the front stop line just roll under the, out of sight under the front of the vehicle before you bring the vehicle to a stop. Okay. Um, all right. All right. Now, Mick, if traffic lights are flashing red or not, uh, always stop. Uh, yes, if traffic lights stop working, it is considered a four-way stop sign, but I can't remember the last time I saw traffic lights out. It has been a number of years, probably 
seven or eight years ago, the last time I saw traffic lights that weren't working. Okay, Rawson, have you been stopped by a train? Uh, yes, I have been stopped by a train coming for Florida. There's a <laughs> hurricane coming. Okay, well, there'll be lots of hurricane warnings for sure. And the Sorry about that. Something caught in my throat there. Uh, excellent. So if there is a hurricane coming in Florida, uh, pay attention to the early hurricane warnings and evacuate as per the instructions. Same thing with the forest fires here that we had here a couple of weeks ago when I was in Ontario. Evacuation. Make sure that you evacuate. Do not hang around thinking that you're going to save your house or your structure or whatnot. You need to leave, okay? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Pierce, I am good. Just had something in my throat there. Uh, now, like parallel parking on the left is a little confusing. Yes, and we have a video for that. Uh, Corey will put that up for you. You can have a look at that as well, now, Mick, and that'll help you out. Uh, Marion, what I do is hesitate a second or longer to see if someone is going to try and change directions. Yes, absolutely. Just pause slightly and then uh, uh, proceed through the intersection. Obnoxious, how are you, my friend? Excellent. Okay, so back to school next week. Uh, kids are back in school, and it's just a matter of being more aware when you're driving, knowing where the school uh, area schools are located in your neighborhood and those types of things. I mean, we have a school over here behind me a couple of blocks away, uh, another school down on the main highway where my daughter is going to be attending high school this year. Crazy to think that my daughter is going to high school already. Uh, going to high school public schools, those types of things, uh, elementary schools, uh, and then colleges and universities and those types of things. Everybody is going back to school in the Northern Hemisphere. So take note of that. Take note of the uh, school and area signs. Corey will put up a video for you on the uh, school signs and what school signs you need to pay attention to. Actually, Corey's pre already preempted me and already put that up. Uh, school signs and zones, read and interpret and pass your driver's test. Okay, so pay attention to all of that. Uh, 3PO, boats are more useful than cars in Florida, especially near the coast. <laughs> yes. Uh, Carrie, making your right-hand turn on a red light, and if many cars are in the left-hand lane but no cars in the right lane, want to turn into should you make a right turn on red or continue to wait? Uh, Carrie, if it is busy and you're on a driver's test, you can wait for the green light. Okay. If there's a lot of congestion and a lot of vehicles and traffic and uh, pedestrians and those types of things you can simply wait okay you don't have to change lanes uh, on uh, you don't have to turn right on a red light the island of Ma uh, Montreal you don't can't change lanes change lanes you cannot turn right on a red light I'm trying to stay on the right <laughs> vernacular here and as well New York City the five boroughs Manhattan Staten Island Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, you can't turn right on a red light, and the posted speed limit is 25 miles an hour, which is a little hard to get used to. And unfortunately, with traffic safety coming on the way it is right now, uh, we are going to see more and more and more residential areas going to 20, 25 miles per hour because we're essentially bringing speeds down to walking speeds. Uh, I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to dissuade people driving and they're trying to encourage public transportation and the authorities, uh, not necessarily the authorities who really know what they're talking about or have a great deal of power, are all about the fact that speed kills. Uh, and it's really not about speed kills uh, because we have more fatalities on highways than we do in cities, but they're convinced that if we drop the speed limits and we have automated enforcement in all of these residential areas that we're going to reduce traffic deaths. We're not. And my professional opinion is, is that we have more and more and more distracted road users. And it's not just people in cars. It's pedestrians. It's kids on scooters. It's people on bicycles. It's people on e-bikes and those types of things. Every one of these people is listening to something in their head. They have headphones on. And I've seen this so many times with car drivers wearing headphones while they're driving. Same thing with cyclists. They got earphones on. They got pedestrians who are walking down the road. They're looking at their phone. 
Uh, I am guilty of this, going down the road, looking at my phone or texting or talking on my phone with a phone call. We have more and more and more vulnerable road users who are distracted while driving and we do not have public education that is targeting these people who are much, much more distracted than car drivers and they're walking out in front of traffic. That is my professional opinion about why we are seeing a spike in pedestrian deaths within cities in the last two, three, four years. It's because of our access to screens that are mobile. Screens that are mobile, phones, because they're not phones anymore. They're computers, they're personal computers. I mean, <laughs> I was looking at iMac Pro as a new phone uh, the other day and it has a 256 gig hard drive. That's crazy, 256 gig hard drive. I mean, I don't even think my laptop has that much of a hard drive in it. Insane, the amount of space. And these computers are distracting people and it's leading to higher uh, deaths amongst the vulnerable road user population within roadways. So unfortunately, I, I don't think that there's any stopping this traffic safety initiative on the part of politicians to reduce the speed limits in residential areas. And unfortunately, as they're reducing the speed limits, to 20 miles an hour where you might as well ride your bicycle because you can ride a bicycle at 20 miles an hour. Uh, what's going to happen is, is that they're going to put in more and more and more of this automated enforcement uh, with uh, speed cameras. And because speed cameras are so expensive to implement, we're looking at old thinking in terms of an enforcement. And because it's random about where they're placing them, there's a lot of political decisions about where they get placed and because they're so random and because they're so sparse they make the fines higher so when you get an automated ticket it's now going to be 200 250 300 dollars but you're not going to get one very often but you're going to get one that's going to be expensive to try and control the level of speeding quote unquote speeding they call it speeding because it's against the law, but the number of 20 miles per hour is a random number. You can still be doing 30 miles an hour in the city and it's considered speeding. That's what's happening. Uh, Eric, eating and cell phone activity are tr and trying to text while driving. Yes. <laughs> uh, obnoxious, I can still listen to my favorite classic rock, uh, rock tunes and I still get from point A to point B fine. Yes, uh, I don't wanna be looking at my phone. <laughs> 3PO and it's thousands of dollars too. Yes, uh, it's cars of GPS better than me. Pedestrians don't even look when they walk regardless. Yes, that's absolutely true. Uh, Carrie, you're right. Uh, waiting is most likely the best answer is if busy since vehicles in the left lane could switch lanes in the intersection. Yes, indeed. Uh, now, make in Ontario, you may turn left on a red light if you are moving from a one-way road onto a one-way road. Yes. Okay. Now, Mick, I know that this seems to be the latest trend of people saying, oh, you can turn right, turn left on a red light on a one-way to a one-way. In my entire driving career, I think I've done it once. Okay. So, it's not something that is very common, but it seems to be something that of late, <laughs> drivers are... Uh, they're, they're obsessed with. I don't know what it is. Uh, a, how do you park out when you front park? Uh, um, how do you back out when you front park? Okay, well, you got to back out and you just go nice and slow until you get clear vision of the traffic in behind you. And then when you're absolutely sure uh, that it's clear to go, then you proceed with your backing up. Uh, Eric, uh, ticket rate same with uh, Street Patrol County or City. Uh, no, they tend to be a bit more pricey. Uh, the thing about automated tickets is, is that there generally aren't demerit points associated and it generally does not go on your insurance as well. It's generally just a high monetary fine. Uh, Ross, and I hope you have a great evening and stay safe. You as well, my friend. Uh, Nalmic, what's the difference between a freeway and a highway? Okay, Nalmic, uh, freeways are don't have intersections. There are no slow moving vehicles on a freeway. Uh, bicycles, tractors, farm equipment, industrial equipment are not allowed on a freeway. 
and uh, there's not going to be any two-lane sections. It's, uh, freeways are, for the most part, are going to be all multi-lane sections, overpasses, and those types of things. So that's just a difference between a highway and a freeway. Esteban, uh, one year ago in Argentina, asking your question. Now I am living at Vancouver in my full license. You are the best. Awesome, Esteban. Welcome to Canada, my friend. Congratulations on passing your license. That is absolutely awesome, my friend. Welcome to Canada. Uh, Marion, oh, I had that question on my learner's test. I didn't know that that was a thing, so I pressed pass to go on the next question, so it's actually a real thing. Yes. Okay. Elevator, I have seen drivers block the left lane when there are numerous vehicles behind them on the highway. That is not the time or place to do it. <laughs> yeah, drivers, you'd be surprised what drivers do. Uh, just watch some of the fail, vi fail videos uh, for sure. Uh, turn left on a red light. Yes, Marion, it is, it is a real thing. And I don't know why they're obsessed with it or why they would put it on a driver's test. Like I said, in my entire driving career, I've been... <laughs> Several countries around the world, all over North America, all over Canada. And I, like I said, I think I've done it once, maybe twice, maybe twice. It's a real thing though, yes. Obnoxious, actually, could you make uh, some videos on left-handed driving like in the UK? Obnoxious, I've, uh, fancy you ask. <laughs> on the 23rd of September we are going to Australia so yes I can make some videos for you and I am planning on making some videos uh, when I go to Australia uh, in both the state of Victoria and in the state of New South Wales so I will be making those videos for you on driving on the left side of the road and sitting on the right side of the vehicle so it's going to be interesting going back because I haven't been back for longer than I would like to say uh, Corey, on phone storage, I think one of the Samsung flagship phones can be equipped with a one terabyte of storage. Uh, kind of blew my mind when I saw that. As you said, it's common for laptops even now to not have that much. <laughs> yeah, Corey, it's it's crazy. Uh, yeah, like one terabyte. I know, and I'm pretty sure that the max, you can get 500 gigs of hard drive space on a phone, which is insane amount of space. <laughs> Eric, watch out for kangaroos. Yes, indeed. <laughs> watch out for kangaroos in Australia. Uh, Chicken, what do you miss the most about living in Australia, Rick? Uh, what do I live most about? <coughs> gum trees. I miss gum trees. You know, trees that lose their bark and keep their leaves, which is very different than here. And the other thing about Australia is everything is absolutely different. Absolutely everything is different. Uh, trees are different, the people are different, the sky, the night sky is different, absolutely everything. So it'll be fun to go back. And uh, we leave here Saturday night, we get there Monday morning. Uh, we're driving to Wangaratta, which is about five or six hours from Sydney, because we're flying into Sydney. And then the next day we're going to Halls Gap, Victoria, and we're staying at a cottage with friends of mine uh, who I went to university with. So that'll be just great fun because I haven't seen them in quite some time and it'll be just great to be reconnect. Uh, the other great thing about Australia as well, uh, my friends and I all finished university and then we all had kids about the same time. So all our kids are about the same age, uh, which is interesting and should be great fun. <laughs> so it'll be just absolutely fun to um, go to Australia and revisit and, you know, show my kids all the stuff that I know about Australia and visiting and whatnot. And uh, we're, we're stopping in Glen Rowan, which is right near Wangaratta. And as some of you may or may not know the story of Ned Kelly. And Ned Kelly was an Australian outlaw, uh, the underdog, uh, you know, persecuted by the authorities and then captured and hanged. Of course, he did kill police officers. So he was an outlaw, but uh, interesting story if you get to have a look at it. There's also a movie with Orlando Bloom and Heath Ledger. If you don't want to do the research online, you can definitely watch the movie about uh, Ned Kelly and learn about uh, the Australian outlaw. And uh, we're going to go to the Melbourne Jail, which is a, uh, it's now a museum. You can go into the old cells, big block building, you know, con uh, stone block building. And you can see the gallows and those kinds of things. So it'll be it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, a, when you do a U-turn, do you have to go to the left lane since you're turning left? Uh, not sure what you're saying. Uh, when you're doing a U-turn, you got to pull over to the right and get to the right as much as possible. This is for those of us turning driving on the right and then make a U-turn to come back the other way. All right. 
Uh, Carrie, I hope you and your kids have tons of fun visiting Australia. I know we will for sure. Uh, what's the updates on your book? Uh, Chicken Wing, the updates. The book is now available on Amazon, and maybe Corey can find that link for you. You can have a look at that. Okay, Jackson, I made a pretty good left-hand turn and uh, felt confident about it. I judged the gap really good, and also I was not nervous and driving hardly on uh, the past week. That is awesome, Jackson. Sounds like that you're... Training is going exceptionally well, my friend. Awesome, awesome. Keep up the great work. Uh, absolutely perfect. So backing up, yes. Uh, 3PO, here's an extreme example of exposure therapy. Many new ER surgeons are petrified of gore and bloody bodies, but the more they see and operate, they get uh, desensitized to it, even becoming routine. Yeah, and uh, it's... Like so many things, and I mean that's a, that's a perfect example of ER doctors dealing with trauma and the mutilation of bodies, especially car crash victims. Uh, you know when they've lost limbs or they're or they sustain blunt force trauma that can be sustained in a traffic crash, because a lot of people think that you know it's a little bit like we're there's a misperception about traffic crashes portrayed in Hollywood films when the reality is is that you sustain tremendous injury in traffic crashes and these doctors you know this is why they have an internship that's three four years uh, so that they can work with somebody else and it's not that they're desensitized it's that you know they're able to deal with that and it's like so many things think of it like your 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 driver's license test if you know what's coming down the pike, then you're much better equipped to deal with that issue, right? Uh, so exposure therapy, it's and I, you know, it's not a very good example of exposure therapy because it's not like there's something wrong with them uh, or have sustained some sort of trauma like a PDS, PTSD, like people who are in war or those types of things. PTSD, traffic crash victims, people that have difficulty driving, they sustained a trauma that has led to PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and they have a psychological issue around driving. Doctors aren't that you know, doctors who are getting trained to become surgeons or ER doctors, there isn't something wrong with them. They didn't sustain an injury, whether psychological or physical. To do that job so the comparison doesn't really work it it, it works a little bit but it, it it doesn't really work because doctors don't become desensitized it's more that they know what's happening right they know what to expect and when you know what to expect it's the same thing as your driver's test if you know how to parallel park and you know how to do a three-point turn and you know how to back into a parking space when you get on the test and the driving examiner says to you okay I want you to parallel park you're like yeah okay I got this I got this it's the same thing with a doctor who we have blunt force trauma uh, trauma to the head sustained an injury by striking the steering wheel uh, kidney failure those types of things diabetes uh, you know sepsis whatnot then they know what to deal with they know what to expect they know what the body's going to look like and they know what the symptoms are going to be so it kind of works but it's not really the same thing as when somebody sustains trauma and exposure tra uh, exposure therapy is something is a course of action so that you can begin to heal and begin to move forward in a positive direction so it's something very different but i like that that i you gave me that and i had to um, work through it because you know exposure therapy is a very powerful tool to help people to get back to driving and overcome trauma but it's not the same thing as dealing with trauma and trying to help other people uh, pedals uh, mild car accidents are different kinds of shock to me as I found out too especially since the whiplash and injury internal not visible others uh, with me didn't believe me yeah and that's unfortunate too it's the same thing uh, pedals when people sustain PTSD uh, you know a, a lot of people don't actually see any injuries it's the same thing when veterans come back from the Middle East and are, are you know have PTSD other people don't know what's going on because there's no physical injuries and there's no telltale signs that there's something wrong with this person so 
lot of discussion around exposure therapy and that yes it can help you out to get back to driving and overcome anxiety and those types of things but there we go uh marion the problem is too now the injuries sustained are worse because the vehicles are not built the same as years ago uh, they fold up very quickly. Actually, uh, that's not true, Marion. Actually, the injuries are less now due to that very fact. Because the vehicles fold up for the very reason that they absorb the energy and dissipate the energy uh, around the cabin. Okay, so the cabin actually is intact after the traffic crash and protects the vehicle occupants via seat belts and airbags side impact airbags and those types of things it looks like you know it's a minor crash of 30 or 40 kilometers an hour and the front of the vehicle is completely crumpled in the reason is is because it's absorbing and dissipating the energy from uh, the kinetic energy from the two vehicles or the vehicle excuse me crashing into a fixed object so m more people are surviving traffic crashes now and it's not just automotive safety technology it's a whole host of other Uh, other pieces in place for traffic crash victims, emergency response times. We know that we can have to get people into surgery within 50 minutes, the golden hour sort of thing. Uh, GPS, uh, phones, those types of things. Uh, you know, cities, uh, access and proximity to emergency facilities and those types of things. All of these things are helping to keep people alive and to sustain traffic crashes. So, uh, People, in fact, sustained greater injuries uh, 30, 40 years ago when vehicles were completely, you know, they didn't absorb any energy. It was completely all transferred into the uh, cabin where uh, vehicle occupants and those types of things. So vehicles, in fact, yes, are safer now, but there's other host of other things too as well that are helping to keep uh, vehicle occupants alive and whatnot. Uh, pedal, so it's safer to have a crumpled car than a fender bender with a lot of impact but didn't do damage to the car. Yes, indeed. You want the vehicle <laughs> to be able to crumple up. That's what's going to keep you safe because it's going to absorb the energy. Uh, Eric, how are your kids going? I bet you can't wait for your daughter to start driving. Uh, Eric, no, actually, you know, if we can postpone that as long as possible, that's great. Uh, we got three years and then she's going to start driving. Uh, chicken wing. No, no, uh, jujitsu stories. As I said, I've been away on holidays, so I haven't been to jujitsu for three weeks. So no stories there, unfortunately, but next week we're getting back. Uh, 3PO, of course, uh, context is different. The goal remains the same. The more you do something and gain exposure to it to get, uh, through the fears, the more you become used to it. Yes, indeed. It works out for sure. All right, uh, if, as I said at the beginning in the introduction, I just want to revisit this in the last few minutes we have here. Start thinking about winter driving because winter driving is coming up and I've ran a few polls in the last couple of months and a lot of people are terrified, petrified of driving in the winter time. However, if you're thinking that you have a driver's test, you could get your driver's license in the next few months. I do strongly encourage you to consider taking your driver's test in the wintertime. Here's why. First and foremost, the driver's test in the wintertime is easier. Easier, highlighted, underscored, in the wintertime than it is in the summertime. In the summertime, driving uh, license centers are backed up, they're booked. Uh, driving examiners are working crazy hours because it's the busiest time of the year. In the wintertime, there's less bookings. Driving examiners are more relaxed. They're going to give you kudos for taking your driver's test in the wintertime. Okay? Despite what most people think that it's a blowing blizzard every day of the winter, that is not true. There's only maybe half a dozen days in the winter where you actually get snow and the roads are snow covered. Most of the time in the wintertime, the roads are going to be clear. All right? You don't have to get between the lines in a parking space. You don't have to back 6 to 12 inches from the curb. You only have to get in behind the car in front of you. So you only have to stop behind the sidewalk when you're at an intersection. You don't have to stop at the correct stopping position all the time. So it's easier in the wintertime. If it is bad and blowing snow and storming and those types of things, the test center is going to cancel the test and postpone it to another date. So... I encourage you, I strongly, strongly encourage you to book and take your driver's test in the wintertime. It's not that far away. A couple of months now, we'll be into winter. Take your driver's test in the wintertime. It is going to be easier. 
Don't postpone it till next spring. I know that most of this is following on, falling on deaf ears, but I'm gonna keep saying it. I'm gonna keep encouraging you, take your test in the winter time. If you have good tires in the vehicle, you're gonna be fine, okay? Practice, take your driver's test in the winter time because it's going to be easier to pass your driver's test in the winter time. Uh, Marion, I'm rather nervous about uh, driving in the winter. Marion, it's gonna be absolutely fine. You're gonna be great driving in the winter, okay? Uh, a, is looking in a blind mirror the same as looking at the wing mirror? No. Uh, you want to shoulder check, and shoulder checking and looking in your mirrors are not the same thing. Okay, uh, elevator, if you're taking a flight, book your flight ahead of time. Yes, indeed. Uh, before the pandemic, we used to be any flight that got there on time was a good flight. Now we're at the point where any flight that is that actually gets to your destination is a good flight. So yes, book lots of time if you're taking a flight. Uh, Eric, don't forget about snow tires. Thanks for all your knowledge and expertise. You are the best. Thank you so much, Eric, for your kind words. And you are greatly appreciated, my friend. Uh, Corey, uh, if two tanks ran into each other at high speed, I imagine the theoretical survival rate for the occupants is way lower than a modern car. Yes, it is. It absolutely is because they're just like two loggerheads hitting each other. Uh, Carrie, just make sure you drive more slowly than the speed limit uh, and the icy in the winter. Yes, and it's not icy all the time in the winter. Okay, roads are really well maintained. Okay, lots of salt, lots of sand, and those types of things. So definitely uh, take your driver's test in the winter time. Okay, thank you so much for all your questions. Great live stream. Take care. Uh, if you have any questions, you're watching in the replay. Uh, look down in the description there. Uh, check out past your driver's test first time course package over at the smart drive test website as well driving test secrets is available over on amazon Corey will put up the link for that or i'll put it down in the description there so have a look for that and remember pick the best answer not necessarily the right answer have a great day bye now